in the treatment of Parkinson's disease all over the place. And I'm going to start with uh, dance by showing you this wonderful video that was made of our program at Stanford, and it also introduces what Parkinson's disease is. I'm a therapist, and I was taking notes after a session. I would start writing, and I couldn't quite finish the sentence. When I went to the doctor, she had me write a sentence or two and walk up and down the hall, and I came back in the room, and she said, you have Parkinson's disease. Eight years ago, I had been diagnosed with Parkinson's. My first reaction was, let me think about this. I was hoping that the doctor is wrong. They had their wrong so many times. <laughs> but this was not one of them. So we have to live with this, so what? Life goes on. Parkinson's disease is a progressive neurological disorder. Resting tremor, slowness of movement, stiffness, and difficulties with balance. But we also know that it has a lot of what we call non-motor features. These can be anxiety, depression, sleep disorders, pain, autonomic nervous system disorders. Unfortunately, some people can also have cognitive problems that lead to dementia. So it is a motor and non-motor disease that affects really the whole brain. There's a lot of research in both animals and in human subjects with Parkinson's disease that exercise is very beneficial. It actually promotes what we call neuroplasticity. The brain almost regenerates. Dance itself also has quite a lot of research as far as improving mobility and balance in Parkinson's disease and gait quite dramatically, people's ability to walk. Parkinson's disease is a program that was developed at the Mars Morris Dance Group. In about 2001, Ole Westheimer, who led the Brooklyn Parkinson's support group, marched into the Mark Morris studios and she said, I would like you to teach people with Parkinson's disease how to dance. And David Leventhal, who's now the program director of Dance for PD, began to teach dance to people with Parkinson's disease. They have now trained over 600 teachers who are now certified Dance for PD instructors in over 16 countries and 100 communities. So it is being practiced all over the world. Dr. Bronte Stewart, who is a dancer, had encountered Dance for PD and thought, I'm going to bring this program here, and made great strides in achieving this kind of radical Thing, where we have a dance studio in a clinic. <laughs> I was a tap dancer growing up, and a friend told me that they were going to start Parkinson's Dance at Stanford, and I was I was ready. I have known all my life that I am uh, no good at dancing. <laughs> now at least I have a good excuse. <laughs> Some of these folks that come to class would never have imagined taking a dance class before, but for some reason this spoke to them at this time in their lives, and when they come, they're in excited about this new adventure that they're on. What we've been told by people who do dance with PD is that suddenly they feel beautiful again. Their bodies feel like they can move. They have a sense of themselves as they used to be, and I think that is incredibly powerful as far as brain health. I think it's a combination of feeling the connection with my body that is a positive connection and that reminds me of maybe my old self and feeling good about moving. The full impact of dance for PD is not just like an exercise program. 
it is something that engages cognition and it engages the cognitive domains that are specifically affected in Parkinson's disease. Little by little I am expanding my boundaries. I feel intuitively that it's opening for me memories, possibilities, ways of being. It gives me the sense that I can handle what is ahead for me. There's a joyfulness that I feel from the class that carries through and powerful kind of feeling that I can do something to make myself feel good. suggesting that dance and different types of dance are actually very therapeutic. Uh, and I think it's only now just becoming, we're more becoming aware that this is not just in terms of mobility, but also in terms of cognitive function and this sense of embodiment that is becoming more and more important as I talk to my patients with Parkinson's disease. So different types of exercise have evidence-based uh, therapeutic actions, such as high-intensity resistance training, sensory-enriched exercise, balance training, treadmill training, for stationary bike pedaling, which is really where this all started. Uh, the big large amplitude training that is now um, a documented uh, physical therapy type of program for movement, and there's also a loud training for speech that, had it, that works for PD, and of course dance. Sadly though, uh, the people with PD actually tend to reduce their activity after diagnosis. They, until recently, uh, sorry, um, only 12 to 15 percent were actually referred for exercise or physical therapy at the time of diagnosis. Luckily, that is changing now. And, un and believe it or not, the American Academy of Neurology did not recommend exercise or physical therapy for Parkinson's disease until fairly recently. So we still have a long way to go. So I'm, I'm actually going to leave art and dance at that point, and I'm going to jump and uh, now go to something that is. Um, a little bit more invasive, and this is something we call deep brain stimulation, and you can regard this as the first generation of, brain, of a pacemaker and a brain pacemaker. And what we do is we have a chronically implanted uh, lead in the brain, this pointer is a little difficult to use, um, which is then connected subcutaneously to a standard pacemaker. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about quickly is where we're going with this therapy that has been around since the late, late 80s. You'd say, well, why can you do this? And obviously we know that if we use cardiac pacemakers, we know exactly where we need to put them based on how the heart conducts electricity. The brain itself is organized very nicely for us in a way that actually allows us to do this. And that is that the major networks of the brain, basically the associative network, which is cognitive, the limbic network, which is mood, and the sensory motor network, are somewhat anatomically segregated, basically in the cortex, and also in these deep subcortical structures called the basal ganglia. And that allows us to implant these deep brain stimulating leads in one of these networks, to a great extent not affecting the other networks. And if this wasn't the case, then we couldn't have actually used this type of therapy. So this has become a very useful therapy for people with Parkinson's disease, and I'll just show you a quick video to show you that it really does work. And here's a lady who has Parkinson's disease, and she has great difficulty getting out of the chair without using her hands, and this is very classic. Uh, people have great difficulty getting out of their cars and out of chairs, and when she does, she has a very classic short step shuffling gait. She can't heel strike, and basically, 
The reason she's doing this is she has to keep her center of mass extremely still in the anterior posterior direction. So she has to kind of just move herself forward like that, and as she turns, she has to shuffle her way around. And you can see the resting tremor here in her hand, and also this very, a lot of akinesia, fixed arms in front of her body. And here she is on no medication after six months of deep brain stimulation. And you can just see that nice, relaxed movement has come back. Um, she's gained a bit of weight, which uh, has been something that we've been seeing partly because they're not dyskinetic anymore. So um, moving on quickly, uh, no therapy is always good for too long. We always pick holes in it. And what is wrong with this therapy? Well, it's called open-loop non-responsive continuous DBS. And I'll take you back to the cardiac pacemaker uh, early years when they would put these sternal wires uh, you know, into the chest and they just turn on a stimulator and they pace the heart. But the, the leads had no idea what the heart rhythm was doing and they'd cause as many arrhythmias as they'd fix. Well, for 40 years, we've been doing that in the brain. We've been basically pacing the brain 24-7 uh, without knowing what the brain signals are doing. And that is our research, which is now we're changing this and we're moving towards closed loop or demand-based uh, brain pacing. Um, so what do we mean by open loop and non-responsive? Well, it means it can't sense the brain activity is modulating. It also can't respond to whether the patient is asleep or awake, whether they're sitting down still, whether they're moving around, whether they have dominant symptoms of tremor, or the stiffness and slowness, gait problems, freezing of gait, and very importantly, what their medication, <coughs> dopaminergic medication levels are in their bloodstream or their brain. It's continuous, means it cannot automatically change or optimize the stimulation parameters, nor the location of stimulation based on the patient's state or symptoms. There is a one-size-fits-all stimulation parameters that, as we were talking about earlier, is now being used for cognitive and mood disorders, and people are just doing this empirically. And combined medication and deep brain stimulation can cause adverse effects because they have the same effect on the brain rhythms. And I'm going to move and tell you what those are. And one of the beauties that we've had in putting these deep brain stimulation leads into places like the subthalamic nucleus, which is this red structure sitting underneath the thalamus, is that in order to put this correctly in that sensory motor network, we actually take fine microelectrodes and do extracellular recording of these units in the sensory motor region or in the nucleus. And what I do is I have the patients instrument, instrumented um, with wearable sensors on their feet and their hands, and I'm moving their, their joints, and I'm also, you can see we've got headphones on, I'm also recording the single units. And here I'm rapidly extending the elbow and I'm flexing it, and you can see that this unit is responding, so I know I'm in the sensory motor region. That way we basically map out the region and place this lead with submillimeter accuracy in the network of choice. But we can also record basically what we call the local field potential. So a single unit is like me talking right now and everybody else is quiet. You can regard the local field potential really as the crowd chatter. So if you go into a room, you can hear lots of different chatter going on. And the normal situation in the brain is where that chatter is just going on independently. In Parkinson's disease, we have another problem. And that is that here's the, a representation of the deep brain stimulating lead in the subthalamic nucleus, and it has four electrodes on it. And we can record from these electrode pairs, and so this is from the most ventral or the lowest electrode pair, this is from the middle one, and this is from the top one. And what you can see is the raw signal and also this time frequency spectrogram. <coughs> Hot colors mean more power, and so you can flip this on its side here, where frequency is on the x-axis, and you can see there's excessive power in a certain frequency band, which is called the beta band. And this should not be there. If, if you were just listening to the crowd chatter, it should be what we call a 1 over F curve or an exponential. And this is like the crowd starting to chant. And that is abnormal, and that is excessive in Parkinson's disease. And so what we basically have is we have a brain arrhythmia in Parkinson's disease. I don't have time to show you the data, but both medication and deep brain stimulation Take, attenuate this rhythm while they improve symptoms. So here is a perfect setup for us to be able to start thinking about closing the loop. And so can we take the brain signals, or, in ca in, or can we take behavioral signals, such as tremor or signals from gait, and actually use those to drive the stimulator only as needed? And that's the research that I'm going to just touch on today very briefly. 
So for instance, here's a gentleman with tremor, resting tremor, very classic, and we have this wearable on his hand, and we use one that is Bluetooth enabled and connected to our computers, and we can use that to actually drive the deep brain stimulator sitting under his skin in his chest. And this is basically just a snapshot of some of the results. And you can see here, this is basically the tremor signal turned into a, a, a power by using a fast Fourier transform. And you can see that as the tremor goes up, uh, we choose these two thresholds. As the tremor goes above the blue threshold, we ask the stimulator to increase its intensity. If the tremor is power is in between these two thresholds, we do nothing. And if the tremor goes below the magenta threshold, we tell the stimulator to decrease its voltage or its intensity to zero. This is an example where a person had intermittent tremor, and so they really didn't need that stimulator to be on 24-7. In fact, they only used the stimulator for 11% of the time it would have been on in the open loop situation, and they had very nice control of their tremor. And what we noticed in this paper, which is published, is that this was different for every single person. So we shouldn't be using a one-size-fits-all. We should be customizing this. Uh, so in fact, the results were across the group that the, what we call kinematic, the closed loop deep brain stimulation driven by a tremor signal, used 76% lower voltage or intensity than open loop deep brain stimulation. It was only on for an average of about 52% of the time, and it had a significant reduction in tremor. So clearly an advance. I'm just going to show you a quick example of actually, now we're actually, each time we do this, by the way, we have to have an FDA IDE, so we have to go back to the FDA every time we upgrade this device. And so we, we finally started using the device where everything was, all the algorithms were implanted on the stimulator itself. We call it fully embedded closed loop PBS, using the brain signals now, but we've done a lot of work to determine which are normal and which are abnormal. And what I'm going to do is just show you a gentleman, now we've got synchronized video and kinematics here of him trying to do a flexion extension task off all his therapy. So here you can see he's barely able to do this, and he has what we call progressive bradykinesia. So he starts off relatively well, and then his angular velocity, which is what this is measuring, and his frequency taper down very quickly. This is one of the worst problems for people with PD. They start off speaking nice and fast or loudly, and it tapers down. They start off moving or handwriting nice and big, and then it tapers down. And deep brain simulation has not been able to fix that very well. So here he is after one hour of closed loop deep brain stimulation using his own brain signals to drive the device. And you can see that now he's obviously a lot better. But what's really interesting is that he stays better, basically. And I'm not able to show you what he was like on his open loop. But he's, you know, on his open loop, he still started waxing and waning. We asked him to go home and think about how this was. He didn't know which was open loop and which was closed loop. And we asked him to tell us what he thought. And a few days later, he followed up with this amazing statement, uh, which ended up matching what we saw in the results. And he said, the best analogy I thought of is like riding a 10-speed bike up a long hill climb. Just as you start feeling some fatigue and slowing, the gears automatically shift. The result is you feel less resistance and have newfound stamina and energy. As you continue, it shifts again, and it seems to do this in advance of the fatigue. It's an amazing sensation. And so this is something we were not expecting from closed loop DBS, would be the fact that the brain is basically, because it's not on continuously, maybe we're not generating tolerance in the brain. We're sort of updating it all the time with their own brain rhythms. And that is actually allowing people to be able to move faster and for a longer period of time. So I'll just finish with a quick summary that we have now done. We've now published the first feasibility study using the chronically implanted neurostimulator, which is people have had for almost two years and a novel dual threshold algorithm based on customized therapeutic windows. And we've shown that this is safe and tolerable in Parkinson's disease patients. It improves bradykinesia and tremor significantly. And it uses literally about 50% of the total energy delivered that would have been used during open loop. And that may translate, obviously, into longer battery life, but also fewer side effects. It can adapt to the onset and the offset of medication doses. And this has been shown by the Priori group in Italy resulting in a more stable response and fewer side effects from combined therapy. And in the future, what we're working on now is to use both neural and kinematic closed loop strategies independently and together to allow a seamless automated therapy for different states of activity and different dominant symptoms. And we think that the closed loop DBS work that we're doing for Parkinson's disease 
will open new avenues for treatment for a wider range of neuropsychiatric disease once people understand and are able to record what are the abnormal rhythms and abnormal signaling versus what is, is normal. And I'll just thank the uh, previous and current members of my lab, our uh, collaborators, and also very importantly, the people with Parkinson's disease who spend many hours with us um, and without whom this research wouldn't be possible. And I'll finish there. Thank you.